The Powers Project. To start our show today, Stell, I'm going to do the uh, gong so it uh, aligns our chakras. So here we go. There we go. <laughs> we'll see if that sticks or not, if we keep that or not. <laughs> so, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really glad that you, uh, you came today. I, the message that you have is just so important to people. And I just don't think they give it the due that it needs, that the importance that it, that it really, they should, it should take place in front of almost everything else that they're doing. And uh, why don't you tell the viewers and listeners a little about yourself? Sure. Um, well, I'm a cancer survivor, and um, I, I'll back up to 2013. Um, it's a really significant time in my life, and it's the reason why I do what I do. In 2013, my uncle, our family dog, my little brother, myself, and my father were all diagnosed with cancer. Um, we were all diagnosed with blood cancers. And so in that year, I had to learn to be a caregiver and a patient at the same time. We thought it was really odd that we all were diagnosed with cancer within the same you know, time frame. And so we started asking questions naturally. And in 2014, when I was told I was in remission, um, I began doing some research and reaching out to the people I grew up with in my hometown on the Space Coast of Florida asking if anybody else were diagnosed with cancer around the same time frame. And I actually started having people I went to high school with come forward and say, yes, I was diagnosed with kidney cancer. And my neighbors, yes, I was diagnosed with the same exact cancer as your dad, multiple myeloma. Or my brother and I, who were diagnosed with Hodgkin's, or my uncle, who was diagnosed with lymphoma. So I started growing this incredible list of just cancer survivors, their families, patients, and the list went from 10 people to 20 people to 100 to 500 people. And that's what really started my journey, this insane journey that I never anticipated being on um, towards looking for answers and you know what was going on. Our case was so unique that we were invited to do genetic testing. And our genetic testing showed that we had no mutating genes, which typically means it could have been something environmental. It usually points to environmentally caused cancer. And when you fast forward, you know, throughout the years, I was just, you know, really connecting with my communities and really just building this incredible cancer survivor community or cancer patient. We were there as like a support system. And then when you fast forward to 2018, a Department of Defense report came out. It was made public. And we found that on Patrick Air Force Base, there was 4.3 million parts per trillion of a chemical called perfluorinated compound, also known as PFOA and PFOS. The EPA safety limit for that chemical is 70 parts per trillion. 70? 70, just 70. And it, it should actually be lower, but just imagine looking at an astronomical amount of 4.3 million, million. It's just unbelievable to think that that was tested in their wells. And my family grew up, you know, we lived in Cocoa Beach and then we moved over the bridge to Cocoa. So I started connecting the dots like, wow. And I started looking at all of my names on the list because when I collected it, I collected people's names, their diagnoses, their ages they were diagnosed, and the city that they lived in. And I started noticing hot spots, and one of those hot spots was Satellite Beach, South Patrick Shores area, which is right next to the base. And of course, Cocoa Beach on the other side of the base. This perfluorinated compound, PFAS, also known as a forever chemical because it bioaccumulates and it doesn't break down in the environment. So you can only imagine what it does to your, your body, right? Right. <laughs> Especially ingesting it in drinking water. How old were you when you start, like when you discovered this and you started doing this research? Um, I, it was in 2014. How old was I? <laughs> I don't even know how old. I, I, when I was diagnosed, I was 28. So I was 29 when I started. And so in your community you found that in the surrounding community that all these people were infected who lived in this these two particular areas well it, it was more than just those two particular i was just seeing like for instance that one community south patrick shores and satellite beach i noticed that 
you know, the list wasn't just 50 people. It was like 300 people that had came forward and said, you know, hey, I was diagnosed with cancer too. And what's really weird is I was really only collecting in, in cocoa. I was trying to, but I just had all these people from surrounding areas like Titusville and even Orlando or West Coast that would say, I want to be a part of your list. I want to, I want to count. And I, you know, so I would, I would add them to the list because I'm like, every person should count. You're more than a number to me. Cause I know the healthcare system kind of just looks at us as a number, you know? And I wanted people to know that you count to somebody, what you are going through matters and your name being on this list matters. You're, you're contributing to something so much bigger. It was hard to explain, but it was helping me find answers and some closure to what my family had experienced. But in the process, it also gave me an amazing support system, like, and, and these other families a support system, all of us just coming together and being able to say, I've been through this, and now I have somebody who just gets it. Because not everybody understands health issues unless they've been through it. You know, having to go in the hospital, out of the hospital, losing your hair, losing your eyebrows, getting connected to those wires, getting sick. Um, you know, just being able to go to other people that you may not barely know, but you are able to, it, it's, you have this odd connection, just this really strong connection with these other people because of what they went through, simply because of what they've been through. So, yeah, it was one area, but there's a couple other areas of concern, like in Titusville, and then we've also found, you know, it's grown since, since I even began this. So we found a group down in St. Lucie, Florida, that has glioblastoma brain cancer cluster, um, and it's, it's really bizarre because it's a really, really rare, it's supposed to be a really rare cancer. And they can't figure out what is going on down there. But it's really easy to Google um, some of these clusters that I'm talking about today because they've been in the news and they've really come forward with, with these issues. On the West Coast, there's a Bradenton High School. They also dealt with a cancer cluster. Uh, actually, one of the, the sisters, she lost her sister in high school, she is one of our directors now for my nonprofit organization. Um, in her school, they found that a lot of the kids were getting diagnosed with leukemia and blood cancers as well, and then they found that there was contamination next to the school that was potentially getting into their drinking water. So all these these PFOs, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, this yeah. is, so that's supposed to be 70 per... Parts per trillion. Per trillion, and it's 4.7 million, mm -hmm. did you say? At okay. that base. At mm -hmm. that base, okay. How before I so before I even ask that before I even ask how did this get into the drinking water? Your uncle, your father, your brother, your dog, everybody okay? Well, my father passed away in February. Um, uh, we believe he could have potentially contracted COVID because uh, his immune system was really bad. He had the worst cancer of all of us. He had the bone cancer, and it's a lifelong cancer. So he was in remission at the time, but he went downhill really quickly. So we did lose him in February. But my, I'm sorry. my and our family dog, of course, passed away. But my, my brother and myself and we're fine. It's just our uncle and our dog and our father that we lost through this whole battle. So and I really believe that his life would have been prolonged if we weren't exposed to these chemicals in our water growing up. So how did this happen? Like, we're always assured by the city and the county that your drinking waters, you know, that w they take the utmost care to make sure that we receive, you know, clean drinking water. How did this happen? How did these PFOs at that, at that level get into the drinking water of all these different communities? Well, I think people need to understand what this particular chemical is and what it's found in. So... The base uses it in a firefighting foam, and they use an extreme amount of it. Same thing with Kennedy Space Center, same thing with Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. They also have these contaminants. And so the foam washes into these, you know, our surface waters and our rivers, and that's how it gets into our groundwater is, you know, they use a lot of it to put out their fires. They actually do training with it. Firefighters use it. Firefighters are really at high risk of exposure to this because of it being in the firefighting foam. But this chemical is also in um, Teflon pans. It's, it's a non-stick chemical. So, uh, it, you know, if you have cosmetics that are waterproof, for instance, uh, it's most likely in that. Firefighters' jackets. Um, there's furniture that's waterproof. There's water, uh, well, if you go to a fast food restaurant, for instance, your wrappers, it's grease resistant. 
that's, you know, that's also the same chemical that resists the grease in your, your, your wrappers of your burger. So it's everywhere. And it's one of the things that we've been really pushing and fighting in, in D.C. is that we need some regulation because we need to be able to protect consumers. I mean, there's only so much we can do on our own from these chemicals. But when it gets into the water, so you've got to think, too, cancer clusters, if you know anything about cancer clusters, it takes about a decade for something like that to show up. So we were exposed at least 10 to 20 years ago. And um, I know that in the 90s, one of the areas that we saw, South Patrick Shores, they already had a cancer investigation, cluster investigation in the 90s. They were in the headlines. And their cancer was the same cancer that my brother and I had, Hodgkin's lymphoma. There were about 27 cases in a few block range. And they determined, the Department of Health de determined that it was caused by a virus, and nothing ever came of it. Uh, they tried to do a lawsuit. It did, they didn't win their lawsuit. They never figured out exactly what it was that caused all those cancers. So, you know, there's a lot of history here in Florida, and you have to remember that the regulations and things that were different decades ago. So what we were drinking decades ago may not be what we're drinking today either, but there's still so many issues, so well, many. So... In Florida, they have a, we have an aquifer, and that aquifer supplies. I know it, it's not just people from Florida; it, it goes up to Alabama, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes. Like it, from what in into, Georgia? Mm -hmm. Okay, in Georgia. Okay, so so this aquifer supplies a, a great deal of people in Central Florida, and Georgia, and Alabama. And so when this becomes contaminated, it has the does it have the effect? The same effect, like, does it depend, I guess, where, you know, where it, this crime takes place, if you will, um, that it's, you're going to get more parts per gallon, uh, let's say, in Bradenton, if that's where the, the stuff is? Um. Yeah, I mean, that's why we also um, confide in geologists, because they know the landscape and they understand, um, you know, where these chemicals could potentially accumulate, like where they build up and things like that. So there are studies that we need to do. But going back to the aquifer, it is a really unique aquifer. There's no other place that has an aquifer like Florida does. And so you have to remember water moves. So what moves with water? Chemicals. Right. You'll, you'll find these chemicals all through the Indian River Lagoon. They're everywhere. So it's not just our particular area, it's everywhere. And they're just more concentrated near, for instance, Air Force bases. We're not the only Air Force base in the state of Florida that has this contamination issue. It's just we've really pushed an awareness on this particular contaminant. And there's other contaminants of concern as well when you live next to an Air Force base that we're learning about, like perfluorate. That's found in rocket fuel, and the EPA decided not to regulate it when they really should have. And that's what I go back to when I say the, our, the safety and the health of our communities aren't being taken serious enough. And there's too many people being affected by these chemicals going unregulated or, you know, something as simple as saying, you're allowed to put X amount in our drinking water. Like, how insane is that Right. to think about? You know, that we're allowed levels of certain chemicals in our drinking water. So I guess with a lot of people, they think they have a, they have so I don't understand it myself, but they have so much trust in the government as though, well, the government wouldn't allow it in our water if it was dangerous to us. And and I go, you know, history doesn't prove that out. <laughs> it just <laughs> doesn't. If anything, it proves they do the exact opposite. You know, it's like it's almost like they make sure certain communities are, you know, that they're taken care of. But, you know, we look at places like Flint, Michigan, we look at these poor neighborhoods and stuff that where they're not concerned about their drinking water. You know, the people who live in the, the other neighborhoods, you know, the richer neighborhoods seem to not have this now. So the question is, how do people who live in, in affluent neighborhoods not drink the same water as people who don't live in affluent neighborhoods? How does that work? How does that happen? Or does it? You know what it is? It's the people that have money typically invest in filters, in really great whole home filters that cost thousands of dollars. And that's where one of the issues is here in America is, you know, the, the less fortunate communities 
don't have the ability to afford really great filters. And we're paying for water on top of that anyway. You know, we pay our monthly water bill. We should expect them to hold a certain standard and not have to worry about what is in our water or what's being picked up from the water treatment facility on the way to our homes. Because when they do their, you know they do their annual drinking water reports, right? They always right, yeah. come out with their reports. And, you know, for the most part, most of them are good. But what people aren't considering is that when they do those tests, they do it on the outside, of, of right there at that water treatment facility. Right. Okay, what, gotcha. What you have to really think about is those pipes going from the water treatment facility to the houses, there, it has to travel a certain distance to get to your home. So what can it potentially be picking up on the way to your house? Well, and I think that's another thing, too, that no one ever speaks about, is my understanding is, too, is that the piping that was laid, you know, decades, if not almost a century ago, and maybe in some cases, like, you know, certain uh, cities, maybe like Boston or somewhere, you know, where they're, you know the city's been around forever, that the, that these old pipes these cr are corrosive and you're getting these corrosive metals in your water and stuff that and uh, and nobody wants to pay to upgrade the pipe because it's expensive and so yes the infrastructure is one of the biggest issues and when you were saying like well how is it possible that these chemicals got into your drinking water that's exactly it is the infrastructure every time you have a water main pipe burst and they tell you to boil boil your water it's bullshit. Don't do it. Don't boil your water. You have to find an alternative source because when you boil your water, you are boiling out the bacteria, but you're actually volatilizing the harmful chemicals like perfluorinated chemicals or VOCs into the air when you boil it. Really? Yes. Okay, so let's get back just for a second because you yes. talked about this chemical being in, in all, all these different things like wrappers for your burgers or whatever. Yes. So does that, does that relate to, because it's in this paper, does the contact on your bun or whatever, uh, does that actually get into the food? And I'm sure that if it does, it's probably minimal, but I'm, I'm sure it's accumulative, you know, would if you're cooking in it and everything else and you're putting it on your face because it's in your makeup and that it, you know, it accumulates at some point. Yes. Would that be correct? Yes. Yeah. They think that it, it does get on your food a bit, but my biggest concern by ingestion is the water. And, um, you know, it's found in all of the groundwater where I live. And so what do we use groundwater for? Think about that. Sprinkler systems. Yeah. And what are we watering with that water? We're watering our vegetables and our fruits, and this stuff uptakes in, into your fruits and your vegetables. So then you're ingesting it that way. Okay, so <clears throat> I know people my age, sometimes <laughs> we, can, we can be so stupid. I mean, I like to think that we're not for the most part, but we'll say the dumbest things, and we'll say like, well, when I was a kid, we used to drink water out of the hose, and I turned out okay. You know, it's like as if that justifies, you know, everything now. You know, it's like when I was a kid, we used to ride in the back of the station wagon facing the cars. <laughs> so it's like, like, okay, so that makes sense that we don't need to wear seatbelts now. Um, so what you're saying is that over the decades, the the amount of, of – um, the different materials that are uh, chemicals mm -hmm. that are, are getting into our water are much more harmful than they were when I was a kid because of the because of the new chemicals that are out and the, and the use for these chemicals has probably um, increased over the years I would imagine well yeah and I would say you know perfluorinated compounds has been this PFAS, okay, I always just call it PFAS for short to keep it simple or forever chemicals a lot of people know it as forever chemicals because they don't break down Oh, it's just so sad because they've known about the harmful effects of this for decades. And in fact, the Department of Defense knew that it was harmful, and they continued to use the firefighting foam. So, you know, I, I, would, I don't know if I would necessarily say there's more chemicals today than there were then. I think we just know more. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the ability to test for more. We have the ability to gain more knowledge and 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 to try to make a difference on what's going on now. I mean, decades ago, we didn't know as much. So um, especially the public didn't. Now, as far as the government, as far as, you know, maybe the Department of Defense, I think that they had tests and that they knew certain harmful effects because we have documents that show that they, they did these tests and it showed that they, it wasn't, you know, good for you, of course. I mean, I don't think drinking any chemicals 
something that people think, oh, let me just drink these chemicals. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know? yeah. It's, it's, it's just insane to me what is allowed um, consumer product-wise, especially in America. And we don't think about those things when you pick up a glass of water or you turn on your, fa- your faucet and you put it in and you're cooking with it. And I think we need to think more about it. I think we need to look at our water differently and we all need to be the change that needs to happen. If you know anything about Erin Brockovich, she just released a book that says Superman isn't coming. And, um, you know, basically don't rely on the government to keep you safe. You know, it's up to us to keep, to protect our own families and to protect ourselves. You're right. And I, the mentality has been for a long time now that um, that's what people somehow, I don't know where that came about, but they it, over time we've become dependent on the government to take care of us. We believe they're supposed to take care of us. And and they're not good stewards of the people of this country. <laughs> they just aren't. They don't do what's in our best interest. And and it should it should be perfectly clear to everybody out there that when we have our our politicians who are beholding to corporations they're going to pass laws and 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 make regulation less strict for these companies to be able to do what they want because that's who's that's who's funding them and and they don't care what the effects are to us they don't and they've sold us out and that's my humble opinion, but it's backed by evidence that shows that's exactly what they continue to do. And so for us to continue to put our faith into these people who keep smacking us, it's like, oh, I won't hit you again. And they <laughs> hit you again, and you go, oh, okay, they're not going to do it again, though. you know. And they keep hitting us and smacking the hell out of us, and we just don't seem to wake up to that because we, I don't know why. I don't know why people keep buying into this whole nonsense that – they're going to do what's in our best interest when they constantly show they're not. Yeah, I think, you know, maybe it's just awareness. You know, I always say awareness brings action. And, you know, it's one of my goals in life is to bring awareness. I've, you know, spent weeks going door to door and just having conversations about the water locally. And people, some people really just are not aware. Like you said, they just put their faith in like, well, you know, the water treatment facility does it, you know, it can't be that bad. And, I really just don't think people have thought about it before, but until we have conversations like this is when they start thinking about it, like, yeah, I remember that one time my my water looked funky or it tasted weird, or I remember that, you know, we get a lot of water boil notices. I wonder why. It's because your infrastructure sucks and, you know, pipes keep bursting and you should be questioning your local government and asking them, why in the world do we keep getting these water boil notices? You know, what's up with our infrastructure? Are you going to fix it? Because that's one of our biggest issues here in Florida. You know, we have a lot of sewage dumps into our waterways and um, constantly just water main breaks and things like that. And that's what's something that we really need to concentrate on is, is getting that infrastructure in place. And, you know, we're building faster than we can keep up with it. We need to fix it first before we do sustainable development, too. But Okay, yeah. I, have, I have a question. But mm-hmm. before I ask you the question, I was going <laughs> to make a statement about something you just said. Oh, I think it's easier for people to say what you just said. You know, it's like, oh, well, it can't be that bad. Yep. They're, they're the water treatment companies think. Because I think it's easier for them to believe that than to believe the truth. Because if they believe that, then they don't have to take any action. If they, if they, if they do their research and find out that's not the truth all of a sudden it's like oh wow now what do i do and i think people like to be blissfully ignorant because they can just you know go oh well we're fine and 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 they and as long as you don't know any better you're going to be fine you know and that's unfortunate so i already know the answer but i'm going to ask anyway (laughs) is there any difference between the water that comes out of your faucet and the water that's in your toilet no. Okay, so exactly. <laughs> so my point is this. If you, you know, I hate cleaning the toilet, but I do it. <laughs> so but it's saying, in saying that, if you don't clean your toilet for a week, it starts getting this ring around it. Not from anything other than the water, from the harshness of the water or whatever chemicals are in it. And that's water that we're actually drinking. So... I go, if it can do that to your toilet bowl, if it can do that to your sink and your, your bathtub and leave this this film, or it's not even a film, it's, it's some sort of, 
I don't know what it is. I, I've seen it on walls. I know on people who have well water, like the they'll sprinkler system uh-huh. beyond, and you'll see where it hits the wall, mm-hmm. and this big stain is from the water, and it's just water, and so what, and whatever chemicals are in it, and I'm going, and we're ingesting that. That's exactly it right there. I mean, we really need to start thinking about what we're putting into our bodies and what it's doing over time. You know, I go back to when you said the the people that, that will say, um, well, I've been drinking this well water. I'm okay, you know, and I always say, well, you know what? You're so lucky you have impeccable genes because somewhat our genetic make does make a difference in, in our health in the future. I mean, it does play a role. Most definitely. So, I mean... You know, you just are really lucky, and that's great. But just because it's not happening to you doesn't mean it's not happening. And you can't – it's it's so infuriating when I hear people try to dismiss it simply on the fact that, well, it didn't happen to me, so it must not be true. (laughs) Right, and that's exactly what they do. But I think, you know, one of the things points I was was attempting to make earlier is that, you know, when I was a kid – you know, we dumped garbage and, and sewage into our waterways back then, too. But the amount of garbage and sewage that's getting dumped now compared to when oh. I was a kid. Now, there was a cleanup era there that, you know, where we dumped so... Like, you, if you saw some of the pictures of us just dumping car after car after car, like, into these rivers, and you're going, what in the hell were we thinking? You know, this was back in the day when, when mothers would change their babies in the car and then throw the diaper, you know, the, the plastic diaper out on the side of the street, and that was commonplace. Like, nobody batted an eye at it. And you look at it now and go, what in the hell were wrong? What was wrong with you people? But they didn't, it, seriously, and, and not to make excuses, but that was, it, it just wasn't thought about. It, you know, pollution and littering and that kind of stuff wasn't thought about. And nor was dumping stuff into the water. It wasn't something that we considered to even be a problem. Well, and now we're seeing the repercussions of that now. I mean, your future generation is the one that is suffering for the mistakes made in the past, and we don't want to continue that cycle of mistakes. And I think it's time that, you know, our generation makes the difference for our children. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do the work that I do is because of my kids. You know, I think about their future, and I'm like, it scares me to think, you know, what if we have to start looking to the sea for our drinking water sources at one point you know right i mean <laughs> and i and i think that's that's part of it but you know people put trust into us to find the solution you know well we'll find a solution we'll we'll be able to you know to take the salt out of out of the ocean water and we'll be able to drink that you know and it's like at what cost though yes we can do that but it becomes even more expensive than fixing the the problem right now and i i just think that they uh they always think we're going to find a way yeah. and one day we're not going to find a way yeah. <laughs> at least not in time and and it's and like you said the effect the effect that it had on you and your family and the com- surrounding communities of where you live you know it's too late. It's like it, it's already it's already hurt people, mm-hmm. and we should have done something about this a long time ago, and not just go, oh well, now it's time to do something. Especially when we had there was a previous cancer cluster investigation in the area, and we really feel like the, that they swept it under the rug is what they did. And so you're right, it is too late. You know, we don't care. You know, Aaron Brockovich says this, this too, but you know, we don't care about money. You know, nothing can buy back our health at the end of the day it's right. it's really about cleanup and you know not wanting other people to suffer what we've gone through if you talk to the community it's just really amazing to hear their stories and and this their solution is so simple it's i want it cleaned up and i just don't want to drink dirty water anymore or i don't want to be exposed to the dirty water anymore and it's just really sad because um you know we can't turn back time and it's not it's something that happened over decades and it's not going to be cleaned up overnight so if we continue down this path of of polluting and allowing these corporations to pollute into our waterways it's going to be very difficult to turn back time and i think you know that's one of our issues in this state we talk about government and and how they support the polluters is what i basically say you know they're not holding the polluters really accountable 
And that's something we really need. And we need some a major shift and change in that. And that's something that we're pushing for. You know, we've been walking every Saturday at 10 a.m. We've been walking the bridge with signs. And we, it's called Walk for Clean Water. And we're trying to spread awareness and get as many people as we can involved because we're going to do a statewide action on October 18th where everybody stands on the bridge across the state of Florida to demand clean water. This is October 18th. 18th. Mm -hmm. and, where is, and where is this going to be at? Everywhere. If you have a bridge that goes over a waterway, walk that bridge with a sign that says demand clean water. Demand clean water. Okay. October 18th. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more before, before the end of the show. Um, what I wanted, the, hmm, there's, there's a direction I wanted to go. <laughs> so the, much you know, of water. It, well, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like you, you get so frustrated, and this and this is when I end up stuttering and losing my train of thought. Is because I had another person on who was talking about police corruption. He's actually running for uh, sheriff of Pinellas County, and he told me the things that were going on in that police department. And I, and I was just so angry. I had a hard time collecting my thoughts because all I wanted to go, I just wanted to drop the effort every go. <laughs> are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, yeah. you know, is this really happening? And yet it is. And so this, oh, I know what I, it was going to be about, you know, the fact that we have such an, uh, an, a large amount of elderly people in this state and they have this thought like, I'm not going to be around and they don't care. They just don't care. And to me, that is so selfish because you you just you you're like i'm not going to be around so who gives a damn and you don't care about the younger generation and it's because of our generation it's because of the generation before mine that everything is so fucked up for your generation and the and the younger generations and and yet somehow they wipe their hands clean of it and and act as if they have no you know nothing to do with it because well it wasn't me i i didn't have anything to do with, you know you were part of that generation that allowed this nonsense to happen. And I think it's important for your generation and younger generations to realize, just as it was our fault for voting for who we voted for and allowing people to take over the government and to, and to deregulate certain industries so that they could pollute and do this to our water, to do this to our air, to do this to our land, it's just as incumbent upon your generation and the younger generations to go, look, we can sit back and allow the government to run roughshod over us and continue doing what they're doing, or we can take a stand and we can do something about it. My generation didn't. Well, let's just say they didn't do the right thing. They did the easy thing. They did the thing because we were so focused on money. That's the, that was the main things, you know, making sure that we deregulate industries so that that we could make more money, and that's what it became all about. And now, unfortunately, you're paying the price for our stupidity, for our greed. If your generation and younger generations don't take a stand, it's, it's going to be even more unfortunate for the generations to come. And it's going to get to that point where, is, will you be able to find clean drinking water anywhere? And at what cost, like, you know? Yeah. Definitely. I mean, how many people listening today know somebody that's been diagnosed with cancer, has been diagnosed with cancer, or even an autoimmune disease like thyroid, or have a child with uh, that's on the autism spectrum? You know, those are things I, I guarantee I just, at least a majority, 90% of the listeners are like, yeah, I do know somebody, or I am that somebody. And, you know, that's something that you really need to kind of sit down and, and think on and and do you want to change that for somebody else? You know, like you were saying, it's time to take a stand. And I felt so moved to to do this work and, and to try to make a difference in any possible way that I could. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I just knew. I looked at my family, just as I'm saying right now, and I said, I don't want anybody else to go through what we've been through. It, it was, um, I don't, I, there's not even a word to explain what we went through a lot of heartbreak that's for sure you know watching my father seize up have to put on life support twice having to make very hard decisions and seeing him in pain unable to walk you know when you see a loved one deteriorate right before your eyes somebody that used to be a hard worker work three jobs you know at one time and, and try to take care of his family 
just now laying in a hospital bed, going before he was supposed to really go, he, he wasn't able to watch his grandkids grow up, you know, and that's something, it's a direct result of our water quality. What was it like for you? You were 28 when you mm -hmm. got cancer, when you were diagnosed with cancer. What was it? I mean, I can't even imagine to be 28 years old and then be given this, like, heartbreaking news. Honestly, it was really bizarre because my brother, it was three months after my brother was diagnosed with the same exact cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I went with him. He had open heart surgery to remove the tumors. And we've never dealt with family in our, or cancer in our family. We don't have any cancer on any, either side of our family. So we had no idea what to expect. The doctors just kept saying, oh, it's probably benign. Like, it's not a big deal. It's just probably benign tumors. And then, you know, it was a long day of surgery. I remember my whole family sitting in the waiting room. And the doctor came out and he said, it's Hodgkin's lymphoma. It's not benign. It's cancer. And we thought, huh, my brother's only 21 years old. That's crazy, right? And then so you fast forward to three months, and I had just given birth to my daughter. And I started getting really sick. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't walk upstairs. I was getting extreme night sweats. I had um, lymph nodes in my neck come out and all these really bizarre symptoms. And I actually had to push for my diagnosis. I, I knew in my heart that there was something really wrong. And I thought, I think I have cancer too. And I was told I was paranoid by every doctor. They said, that's impossible. There's no way you have the same cancer as your brother or you have cancer too. And, and I had to go to six different doctors before I finally got a CT scan. And, and I was told, oh my God, you have tumors all on the left side of your body. And you can't breathe because there's a 13 centimeter tumor in your chest. And I just remember going home and opening up a bottle of wine and saying, holy shit. And I called my mom and I said, dude, there's something not right, mom. Um, I, I have cancer too. This is crazy, right? And my mom's like, oh my God, we need to start knocking on doors. This is, something's really off here. Something's really not right. And we had those conversations um, a lot through my whole diagnosis. Like we, we talked about this is just so bizarre because all of the specialists even said that they, and every time they would say, where did you grow up? Did you grow up near a power plant? Did you grow up under electric lines or something? Like every time we went to a doctor, they would ask us that. So we were like, well, they're asking us for a reason. You know, they think something's up too. They, they said it was really rare for two siblings to get diagnosed. And then you add in my dad a few months later, he gets really sick, ends up in the hospital. And they're like, oh, he has multiple myeloma. But going through it myself, I was really lucky that I had my brother because he was able to give me a heads up on what to expect, you know, and we, we had a lot of great conversations. I think we bonded over the fact that we went through cancer together. You know, I would call him and he'd say, watch out for the red shit they put in your arm, you know, because it is part of the chemo regimen. And he'd say, because when you pee, you're about to pee out red stuff, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just like little things like that. And then he would say, well, expect your hair to fall out in about a few weeks you know, because he was three months ahead of me. And when he was given, you know, the remission, you know, it was really traumatizing to go through it. I I'll admit, you know, but it wasn't until the aftermath. Like, I was in fight mode the whole time. So the gravity of what I went through didn't hit me until after I was told I was in remission. It was when they said, you're in remission. I said, well, now what? Your whole life just changes. Your The perspective of life changes. You face death, and then you think, well... I've got to be on this earth for something so much bigger than myself, and I want to make a difference. And it really changed. And I always tell people, I'm glad I went through cancer. I'm so thankful that this was the direction my life took because now I'm helping save lives because of what I went through. And that's what's important to me. You know, you can tell that you're a fighter. And I just think about what would happen had you, if you aren't the type of person you are where you are a fighter. Because if you had taken the doctor's prognosis of saying oh you're just being paranoid and didn't go see other doctors because you knew there was something wrong you know the outcome would have been completely different so i'm really happy to hear that you didn't just you know listen to one and and i and i can't say this enough doctors are professionals but they're not god they don't know everything, and oftentimes they'll see, you know, they'll see things over and over, just much like police officers. They'll see the same thing over and over, and so when something out of the ordinary happens, it doesn't even occur to them because they figure, oh, it's the same old thing. 
and they don't and and so they'll dismiss it automatically because of what they've seen over and over and their ex, their experience says oh it's only this when it's not and so i'm really glad that you fought and went to six different doctors to find out that you weren't paranoid and, and if i if i had any advice for people would be like don't just think that your doctor knows everything. I can assure you your doctor doesn't. And if they're being honest, they'll be the first ones to tell you that, yeah, I don't know everything. And and if they really care about you, they'll they'll tell you you should go get another opinion to make sure that they're, you know, that they're right or wrong or whatever. And so I only think about the fact that you had to go through six mm-hmm. to find out that, you know, what you knew inside to be true before you could get them to actually take you seriously and do something about to check to make sure that you know that uh, you weren't just making it up yeah I agree I mean if you think there's something wrong and you know in your gut that it's not normal like if you're young and you're in your 20s and you're unable to breathe walking up three stair steps um, yeah something's definitely wrong you're either really out of shape or you have a tumor sitting on your, right. your airway you know <laughs> yeah so. that's that's the one I'll have to use for now <laughs> it's like I'm not out of shape I have a tumor <laughs> No, I wouldn't even joke about that. Um, so y- your brother, he's doing fine. Yes. Okay, great. Mm-hmm. All right. So, so the government allowed. They kind of just overlooked, you know, this these PFOs in the water and knowing that it was in there and didn't and didn't do anything about it. And does this continue on to this day? Is this still going on? Um. You know, they're, they're planning on phasing out the firefighting foam, that the PFAS that's in the firefighting foam. Um, but we're still in a long haul of a fight with Washington, D.C. because of the administration that we have in there right now. Um, you know, there's, there's so many other things. Like, there's other alternatives to this. But the same DuPont 3M that created this chemical have created a, a different chemical, which is just as bad. And, in fact, I think for you to really, really learn – about this chemical, there's this movie called Dark Waters, and I, it's about a lawyer, Rob Billet, um, who went after them, and he's the one that pretty much discovered all of this. Um, you know, there were workers that worked at this plant, and they were exposed to PFOA and PFOS, and they had all the the issues, you know, the, the health issues that are connected to it. And if you watch the movie, I think it'll give you a so much better understanding of what this chemical is, and, and not just that, but how corrupt and shady the 3M and DuPont was and the EPA and how they played a part in allowing this to continue for decades. And was anybody in prison for this when it was discovered what they did? No, no, no. There's a lot of lawsuits today, but it's, you know, it's a long process that those might not even get done for a decade. Who knows? You know, they get drawn out. And But I know that there's a lot of lawsuits filed against 3M and DuPont um, because of of this chemical that people were exposed to. That's, you know, I guess that's one of the things that I think is the craziest is that if you have a CEO and you have people who are part of those companies and they know that what they're doing is harmful to people and killing people and they go ahead and, and go along with it anyway, how are they not imprisoned? How how do they not get charged with deliberately moving forward with a process that they know can harm hundreds if not thousands of people and cause death even and and get away with it i don't know that's a good question that stumps me too i think there's so many of us that wonder that same question it goes back to you know holding polluters accountable i think that there's laws written and that's one thing you know I've noticed in the state of Florida, because I didn't get civically engaged until this all happened, I'll be honest, I didn't know anything about civic engagement, going to the podium, making speeches, and making my voice heard locally, on a state level, or even on a federal level. And so that's one of the things I strive to do, is educate people on how to become a part of the change, Um, you know, without overwhelming people, but, you know, going, you, you, things have to change on, on all of those levels, but we can't hold them accountable if there's laws that don't allow us to. Does that make sense? So, for instance, I don't know if you've heard of the movement that's happening here in Florida called Rights of Nature Movement. I haven't heard of it. So there's a movement called Rights of Nature, and I think in Orlando right now they have an, amend, an amendment one. It's for clean water. 
And the simplified version, it's on the ballot. So if you guys see it on the ballot, vote yes for it. But <laughs> um, the simple version is it's a way to hold the polluters accountable. So it's giving waterways rights, as you would corporations, as you said. And it's allowing the people to hold these polluters accountable. And the state doesn't want it. They tried to actually preempt this on a state level because they don't they don't want it, you know, it's not them, it's the corporations that don't want right. it, but you know. And of course, they, they have the, the <laughs> yeah, they have the politicians' pockets lined, so of course the politicians are going to do everything they can to, to not get it passed or even get it on the ballot if they, if they have a choice. It's, it's so, I mean, our, our system's so corrupt, I don't even want to get into that. But that's, that's why a, we have to pay attention. That's what I mean right. by civic engagement. We're not paying enough attention. And I think that they complicate things intentionally so people don't understand. And we need to start understanding. We need to start paying attention. We need to start understanding. We need to, you know, there's people that I talk to that don't even know. Like, they, they have a lot of opinions, but they don't even know, like, how a local city council works like they've never been to a meeting it's mind-blowing you know i'm like have you ever been to a meeting have you ever gone there have you ever looked at the agenda you know you might want to speak on that you see people constantly complaining about little things online and it's like well did you go to the council meeting did you make your voice heard did you put it on the record for me the biggest thing is is when I speak at that podium, I don't think about me speaking at the podium. I think about putting it on the record. Because if something were to ever happen to me, I want my children, if they decide to pick this up or the, the generation after me, they can look back at history and see, you know, this was talked about on the record. You know, if it wasn't for people talking on the record and it wasn't for newspapers covering certain things, we wouldn't have discovered a lot of the things we did on the Space Coast as far as, you know, the chemicals that were in the ground and the water. And, you know, it really helped us piece together the puzzles. So I think civic engagement is really important, and we lack that here in the state of Florida. Well, I think we lack it everywhere in this country, mm -hmm. and it's because we get too preoccupied with nonsense. You know, we're, we're sitting there binge-watching Netflix because, you know, that's much more easier to sit on the sofa and, and watch Netflix till your eyeballs pop out of your head than it is to get engaged and, and to actually take action. And I think that's what happens with social media is that people mistake complaining and, and, and being outraged on Facebook. That doesn't change anything. Mm -mm. That doesn't, you know, you might feel better because you got it off your chest. It doesn't affect anything as far as what your politicians, what your local politicians are going to do about, you know, what what uh what laws can be passed or you know all you're doing is venting and and if you don't back that up with some sort of action then your only solution is whining and whining is not a solution it's not you know you can sit there and bitch all day we can all sit there and go <laughs> yeah our water sucks you know something <laughs> needs to be done and then i go sit back you know after i'm done bitching on facebook i go sit down in front of the tv and watch netflix what am i going to do and and here's the thing it's like and I don't think it's just this country. I think it's everywhere. I think that most people don't get engaged until it affects them. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to wait till this affects you? Do you really want to wait until you get cancer, until your child gets cancer, until you go and you wake up and you go, oh, now I should do something about the water problem because it, it caused the cancer that I have. Well, you were warned about it, and you didn't do anything beforehand because it didn't affect you, and now it does. Do we really? I mean, do we really need to wait until mm -hmm. it happens to us before we wake up? And and I I don't know I don't know what the answer is to get people motivated to care about things before it affects them directly. I know it, it is very difficult. Like right now. Even though it's not about our drinking water, our Indian River Lagoon looks like pea soup. <laughs> um, and it's going through an algal bloom. And I think people are noticing it because every time I go around town, people will say, what's going on with the river? You know, it looks really bad. And I'm like, it is. It's really bad. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, um, you know, that is affecting you. That's, that affects the fishing. That affects, you know... Um, it can affect people that have allergies if, if they are very sensitive to certain toxins. 
And so I don't know what will motivate people to do it. We, we try to really push and educate and get people involved. And I think, you know, we always hear excuses like, well, I work all day. I don't have time to go to a city council meeting. But you have organizations like mine that are watching them and putting out the information saying specifically, like, this is what's going on with your water. There's so many amazing organizations out there that keep updated on what's going on across the United States and in the state of Florida that try to put the information out like, hey, by the way, this is going on. You guys might want to pay attention, you know, because they're trying to be sly and slip this in. But you're right. People go on Facebook all the time and bitch and complain, and they don't want to even write an email to their local representative. Sometimes it's as simple as writing an email. If you don't have the time to write an email, then stop bitching and complaining. You know, that's right. how I feel. <laughs> I've seen people who just like, you know, they have these emails where all you have to do is click. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to I want my name signed to the petition. So you click yes. And then you put your name on there and, and they, they won't even do you don't even have to write the email. It's already written for you. You just have to put your your John Hancock on there and it'll send for you. And I've seen people go, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> it's like. How lazy have we become? I mean, honestly, the, when, when it's already done for us and we still won't even do a simple thing like put our name on it and click the little button that says send. Yeah. You know, so, I, you know, I know that part of it is is that w because of social media, because of 24-hour news, we're so inundated with so much stuff 24 hours a day with all the different problems around the world that it just you want to step back and you want to just alienate yourself from all of it you just want to go I don't want to hear about any of it because it just becomes too much you know what do I worry about do I water, worry about the water today or do I worry about you know child abuse today do I worry about any number of issues that we have that um, that affect us and I think it just becomes so overwhelming that people don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and and I tell people, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to save the world. Mm -hmm. Find one thing. Now I'm going to say maybe find two things because when there's something that can directly affect you, like your drinking water, and can affect your children, and can affect your pets, you and your loved ones, you need to do something before it actually hurts. The people that you love it hurts the people of your community and i don't know how you ignore that no i don't and i think the best way too is sometimes it's as simple as as acknowledging the issue and understanding it like you know some of the things we've talked about today um, maybe people have never thought about like you know how far the water has to travel to your house or you know the water main breaks and maybe they never knew about the boil, boil water noses but now, at, you know, sometimes it's as simple as saying, you know what, I think I want to take that extra step and get a filtration system just for that added safety and that added protection, um, you know, just to feel better about, you know, trying, at least try, you know, look at your children, look at your pets. You, you talk about pets and we have seen a lot of issues with pets where they're getting tumors and then you go to the lagoon, for instance, and you see all these fish with tumors. And, you know, one of the things that we've learned, because I do um, extension classes with the University of Florida um, for the naturalist program and in the wildlife monitoring program, I had learned that when there's, when you start seeing wildlife get affected, that's an indication that something's really wrong. And um, it's a good indication. So if you start seeing frogs get sick and you start seeing, you know, wildlife around you starting to collapse, you know, you better start getting worried. <laughs> um, did I know people in Apopka, men in Apopka, who should be worried? Because I remember there's a I remember reading this story about Lake Apopka. It became so polluted that the alligator, um, uh, that's the word I'm looking for. The, the alligators were uh, <laughs> disappearing. Mm -hmm. Okay, because what they found was is that and I I want to say University of Florida went down there and was doing you know research on it, and what they found was is that they weren't able to repopulate because of the pollution that was in the water. It made the male alligators' penises so small that they couldn't impregnate the female alligators. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm so glad I didn't yeah. grow up in a <laughs> Could <pop> you imagine? <laughs> like, 
now I understand why there's so many pickup trucks. And no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm completely <laughs> joking. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, I th- we've heard about uh, yeah. Lake Opaka. Um, yeah, there's a lot of pollution. There. Well, well, once they clean, they I, apparently I don't know what it's like now, but apparently they went and cleaned it up, and then of course the the population began to come back, and now you can see eyeballs in the dark everywhere. <laughs> but it, that you know, it but it took that for them to actually you know begin to clean it up, and like, and that's just you know to add credit to what you said is that when you see a problem in nature, mm-hmm. you need to start worrying then, not wait until you, all of a sudden. You can't get someone pregnant because your penis is too small. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it costs more to clean it up, too. That's what's so crazy right. about this thing. Like, you know, if we would just take care of the problem to begin with, it's actually less to take care of our infrastructure, to take care of, you know, and to hold the polluters accountable than it is to pay for the cleanup after the fact. I mean, I look at South Patrick Shores where we did an investigation while we were doing the cancer water investigation, and we discovered that. Um, through our historical research and knocking on doors, that people were finding military debris in their yards. And basically what they did is the military used it way decades ago, decades ago. They used it as a dumping ground. And instead of cleaning it up before they built the homes, what do you think they did? They built the homes on top of it. Yeah. So there was a house that collapsed because they found it, there was an airplane wing underneath it, and they had to remove that. There's been mortars found. There's been rounds. I mean, we were digging up all kinds of stuff. We were doing metal detecting, and we finally got a formally used defense site, um, a FUDS designation, and they're doing an investigation on it. But if they decide to clean that up, it is going to be costly. It well, would... <laughs> we have a we – have a neighborhood over here called Baldwin Park, and it used to be the old Navy base. And what they found is that the the ground over there was had a, an unusually high amount of arsenic in the ground, and yet they still built on that land over. They did not care. Now, if any if anybody, you know, that's my understanding. If there's anybody out there who's listening to this and says yes, this happened, or no, this didn't happen, please let me know. But that is my understanding because I don't want to put any false information out there. But that is my understanding, is that it had high levels of arsenic. They still built these beautiful homes on that land. It's a very nice neighborhood, but I wouldn't want to live there, and I wouldn't want to, you know because I'm I'm sure that that gets into the water system as well, and. You know, at, at what point do you just go, you know, we need to do something about this. We need to make sure that we don't put people in harm's way just for profit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and it's all over the state of Florida. It's really interesting because um, a part of our work is looking up historical documents to see, you know, if there was anything going on then versus now, you know, just just seeing you find out so much information and one of the things I've discovered is that's across the state of Florida. That's something that was normal back in the day, you know, b- basically using land as landfills. And you'll notice that a lot of the land that was used like that is now like playgrounds and, you know, yeah. parks. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, now I, I'm hoping we don't do that anymore, but there's no accountability. There's just none. I mean, I've got a woman up in northwest Florida. They bought land and they discovered after because they were going to build a house on it. And she discovered um, when they started digging, they digged about three feet in, and there was trash. And she realized, oh, my gosh, this was an illegal dumping site. And then they discovered that it was the city. The city knew about it. They have all these documents that prove it, but nobody wants to take accountability. The FDEP, nobody wants to help this family out that basically doesn't have a way out of the sale of this this property because – now it's toxic. You know, she paid thousands of dollars to have it tested and found that there were dangerous chemicals, and she doesn't feel safe now building on that land. So isn't, isn't there somebody out there like Morgan and Morgan who would take her case and sue them and, <laughs> and say, look, you know, this was – we have proof? I mean, can't – You would think, but um, it's very difficult getting any kind of uh, legal representation or help in, in situations like that, especially environmental situations, because I, I think it's because it costs so much money to take on a case like that. And I, I think there's not many people that are willing to do that. Right. So, all right, let's, let's talk about solutions. Number one, overall, like to help the, the, the big picture, people need to become more active. You, mm-hmm. need to take, you need to take 
you know immediate action and you need to be concerned now don't wait until you know it, it it's knocking on your door and you have somebody who's ill with cancer in your family because you decided not to take action so what would you recommend people do as a for the big picture um well right now first and foremost if you don't filter your water filter your water that that's my first recommendation to to safeguard your family and and yourself. Um, I think that's always a great first step. It, it's always the first step that I see in families that recognize there's a problem. Uh, they usually go out and get a filter filtration system. And I know a lot of people will ask, well, what kind of filter do I get? And I always say anything is better than nothing. There's so many options out there. I guess my biggest recommendation is there's a site. It's an NSF site. And you just want to ensure that whatever filter you choose is NSF certified to filter out these contaminants. And they will list all the contaminants. Arsenic, chromium, uh, perfluorinated compounds is now added to that list. And so you'll be able to see what filter systems um, are on that certified list. And you want to make sure that it's certified because they certify it to show, you know, what is taken out. They'll take the filters, they'll test it. They, it they're very strict in their testing and they'll make sure that those contaminants do get filtered out by the particular filter you're looking at. And you can go, I mean, there's simple things like at Lowe's. I know that they have filtration systems for under the sink, but again, make sure you look it up on that NSF site. And that's why I, I don't ever recommend just a particular filter. Right. Um, just because there's so many out there and I don't feel comfortable. I don't want people thinking I'm promoting a particular brand or anything like that. So. Well, I've been using a filtration system for at least 15 years now if not longer and that's one of, that was the main thing is I want to make sure it was NSF certified and in that it wasn't just some company making claims because unfortunately there are a lot of unscrupulous companies out there who will take advantage who uh, who will make claims and uh, and they they're not verified and if it's not verified by NSF um, I in the, back in the day when I first got mine, this company was also certified by UL, which UL's kind of gotten out of doing uh, water cert or uh, water filtration certifications. Um, so you depend on NSF as far as whether these this company, you know, what it can do can actually do what it says it can do. Um, and it's important to understand that for the majority of people out there who I don't think understand is that while Stel, what, what Stell said is important, that anything is better than nothing, keep in mind that there are some very big-name filtration companies out there who are the worst <laughs> at, at, at getting the chemicals out of your water. What they do is they take the smell out and they take the taste out. And so you think, oh, well, it smells good. You know, does, There's no smell. It tastes good, so therefore it must be good. And it's not. The, the filtration systems that you have in, in refrigerators that you buy with with a filter in it, those fil those filters are about as minimal as you can get. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, and again, it's to take the taste and smell out. So when you when you have an ice maker that's making ice that you know they can have these chemi will have these chemicals in there. So there's no sense in having your water filtered if you're getting ice from yeah. <laughs> you know, a, 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 a the water system that isn't filtered and like you said it can you know it can get to be very expensive so you know for instance i have an under the sink uh filtration system in the kitchen i don't have my whole house you know filtered so i know when i use water it always comes from that source otherwise you know I, i'm going to be dealing with the the chemicals and everything else and there is something you were. I wanted to ask you about with uh, the water, with with our water and chemicals that are deliberately put in there, like oh, fluoride. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So, uh, fluoride is a perfect example of this. I am a believer, a believer in that we do not add anything in the water that is not there um, solely to clean the water, right? And and fluoride is not put in to clean the water. It's actually an added um, chemical. For your teeth. It's supposed to be for your teeth. I call it medicine. And I have spoken at a few city council meetings where they've um, had conversations about taking it out. And we've had hundreds of dentists come. And they're like, you know, we have to do this for, for the less fortunate communities um, because they need fluoride for their teeth. Well, okay, give me a break. There's fluoride 
in toothpaste. There's fluoride in other things you can get, but here's the big but. The fluoride that they put in your water is not the same fluoride that's in toothpaste. So that's, that's the number one thing. The fluoride that's in your water is actually a byproduct from the mosaic, from the phosphate mining industry. So they had to find a way, long story short, to get rid of this waste product. And they found a way. They were like, oh, there's fluoride and it helps your teeth. So let's sell it to all of the communities across the United States. And that's how we'll easily get rid of this. And so that's what we did, basically, long story short. And I think that everybody should have informed consent. It always comes down to informed consent. I'm not going to argue the science against if it helps your teeth or not. I personally would never ingest fluoride. I don't think it's good for your um, insides. It may be good for your teeth, but it always comes down to informed consent. If we allow fluoride to be added to our water, really think about this, what else are they going to try? There was an article that just came out that recommended that they start adding lithium into our drinking water. So, yeah, there was an article out that... Where was this? It was on a, it was a scientific article, I can send it to you, where they had recommended that lithium, because there's high amounts of suicide, be added to drinking water supplies. To me, that is scary as hell. And that I always said, I'm like, if we allow fluoride to get put in our water, where is it going to stop? And sure enough... That th- just seems crazy. Like, they, even the thought of it, it's just mm-hmm. crazy that they would even try to not just normalize it even suggest it Mm -hmm. that's insane yeah i definitely want that because i I, and and i will put that link on uh, on the show so that people can read that and uh and see for themselves so that they understand what you know where this is going um you know i'd read some research that was done in sweden um where they said that the benefit that fluoride has is almost nothing and they said and even if there if, even if it had any benefit dentally they said the risk to your health doesn't even come close to why you would have fluoride in your toothpaste or anything else especially your drinking water and i know that fluoride has the same it's the same compound as like iodine and it, it and it what it does is it attaches itself to the i believe it's the adrenal gland and when it does that it doesn't allow iodine to attach. So, of course, then we become iodine deficient, and we don't have a whole lot of iodine in our diet to begin with. And now that they've taken it out of salt, pretty much, I'd say, I believe the last thing I read was 70%, 70 plus percent of people in this country are iodine deficient. And I have a friend who's a doctor, and when I told her, she goes, We're not iodine deficient. And I said, We are. And when I showed her, she's like, Holy, cr-. they don't even know, wow. you know, because, again, as a doctor, you're seeing patients all day. The last thing you probably want to do is go home and do research right. on, on something that probably isn't part of what you do. And so they're just as unaware as the rest of us about what's going on. And um, Yeah, it's not just the fluoride. I mean, that's just the one thing that sticks out to me because it's like an added medicine. I just always say it's an added medicine to your drinking water supply. And there are cities across the United States that are fighting against it and going to city council meetings and, and requesting that they remove it. And you have that right as a citizen to say, I do not want anything in my water if it doesn't clean my water, right? Like that's their job is to make sure your water is clean. Their job isn't to add medicine to your water. That's what it comes down to, informed consent. And I constantly bring that up at city council meetings. I'm like, I don't care what your dentists say. I don't care what anybody says. It comes down to informed consent. A doctor makes me sign a paper when I go in there as informed consent to do their procedures on me. So why are we not required to give that consent to the water public, you know, the drinking water? It's just crazy to me. But we also have byproducts and and cleaning, um, like, you know, chlorine. If, If anybody's ever, if you have a pool... See how high your chlorine is in your in your tap water. You know, get get your chlorine tabs and see if it's really high in your tap water. We've tested it at times where it's been higher than what's in our pool. Oh, I believe that because I've I've even I went to Tennessee uh, for I forget what it was. It was some convention I was at, and the chlorine was so bad. It like you you turned the tap on, you could smell it immediately. I was like, holy crap! I don't even smell it like this in my pool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like they had so much chlorine in their and their water, you could taste it, you could smell it. They weren't even trying to hide it. I can't even imagine how much chlorine was in that water. 
and I didn't have one of those portable filters because you can get the portable filtration systems that actually work as well and take chlorine out of your water and fluoride. And uh, and I didn't have one on me. And I was like, I didn't even want to drink anything. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> oh, That's how man. bad it was. Yeah, I know. I Now that I've been filtering mine, you'll you'll notice a big difference when you filter your water. Oh, yeah. And then when you go somewhere and you, you could tell when it's not filtered. There's moments, and I, I get these looks from my friends, like, don't tell me it's not filtered. And I'm like, I'm telling you, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> so I, so, so the answer, the, the short answer for, for mm-hmm. directly for us is to get a filtration mm-hmm. system, make sure it's NSF certified, and that it can do what it actually says it can do. Um, there are units that you can buy, you know, above sink, under the sink, whole house units, you know, and usually most of them will, a good company will start at around a hundred some odd dollars, hundred to one hundred fifty dollars. You can get a good system, and I would suggest this as well. The thing that the thing that filters the water out is the filter, so don't go buy. A, real, you know, a nice unit from a, a good reputable company and then go on Amazon and buy a cheap filter to because you don't want to pay the price for a new filter and so you buy this filter that it will fit in your filtration system but it's not the filter that filters out all the chemicals and so yes you can buy cheaper filters on Amazon or wherever else you may buy them but you're you just defeat it's not it's not the unit that takes care of the water. It's the filter itself. And if you put a cheap filter in there, you might as well just have bought you know, a $30 unit then. You know, I would have never thought to do that. <laughs> it's <laughs> I, funny that I, you bring that up. It's like, because wow. someone told me that. And I go, but why would you do that? I go, you do realize it's the filter that cleans the water, not the not the unit. It's the filter you put in the unit. And I go, so when you went and bought the cheap one, it's you should have just bought the cheap unit then. Well, yeah. and then typically like to me I always look at it as a really great investment into my health, you know. It costs more to be sick than it does to take care of your health. And so you only typically have to replace it once a year, you know. Right. Income tax, do it around income tax, and perfect if, time. Yeah, and if there's only one or two in a house, sometimes you don't have to do it for 2 years. It depends on how much water you use. Um, there's the company that I that I actually got mine through. They have a smart filter <laughs> filtration system where it actually tells you exactly how many gallons you've used and tells you if it need you know when you're going to need a new filter. It'll even order it for you. It's you know a smart filter, if you will. And I was like, this is brilliant. I love it. You know, um, but you make a great point, which I you know you know what the Department of Defense said is going to be the number one um, the number one problem for for defense the department. In the in the future, it's and I mean like when I say the future, I mean like immediate future. It's going to be healthcare, healthcare. because so much money is going to healthcare that it's going to harm the the defense department to be able to keep up this massive military that we have, and they said that it's going to, it's going to bankrupt us, and and I agree. So you know when you have something like like this water problem it, to me it's much cheaper to fix the problem than to continue you know taking care of people who are getting sick because you refuse to take you know it's sort of sh- it's very short-sighted on their part mm-hmm. don't you think oh yeah it's j- it goes right back to um you know it's more expensive to fix the problem after the fact just like it is with cleaning up contamination the same goes for your health you know it's it's more expensive to fix it after the fact you know oh now i have cancer you know, chemotherapy isn't cheap. We had to pay t- a little over $2,600 a month out of pocket for my dad's life-saving medicine each month. And that was with insurance. That's wow. how expensive that, that chemo was. So just imagine paying that when, how much was the filters again? How much is, right. you know, taking care of yourself and eating properly and doing right nutrition and exercising, you know? Take care of yourselves. You deserve it. You know, your life is worth it to take care of yourselves and your families. You know, it's... It's funny because I have people I know who they're all about money, you know, and it's all about making money. And I go, you know, the richest man in the world would give every dime he had to get his health back if he lost it. Doesn't matter how much money he has because without your health, you have nothing. And you'll see these people like doing everything to chase money and they don't do anything for themselves to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. And I go, you're you're missing the, the big picture. You really are. And 
and you're absolutely right. It's it's so much more expensive to after the fact to take care of your health when if you just did it in the beginning, especially when you consider that we're the filtration system. And no, and it may seem like we're really pushing the filtration <laughs> system, and it's because we are, folks. We're really pushing, and, and I'm going to tell you why. Not only is it, it, it healthier for you to make sure that these chemicals are in your water, it's like two cents a gallon. Now compare that to the price when you pay go to a convenience store and you pay two dollars for a little bottle of water. Okay, not only are you paying an extreme amount of money more for that bottle of water than you do for the for the gallon of water that you can get from your filtration system. The amount of plastic that goes into these landfills every year because people buy bottled water and then on top of that the plastic they use the, most of them are what is it BPA, BPA BPA yeah most of that plastic is not BPA um so they so they get that plastic uh chemical in their water on top of it you can probably speak more about that and and, and more knowledgeable than i can like are we talking about microplastics i mean I, there have been studies where um and i think people have probably seen these floating around where you know the bottled water being in the heat isn't good because there's something in the plastic that leaches into the water right and i think that's what you were talking right about. yeah exactly yeah. um yeah i mean i'm i'm with you on you guys bottled water i, I said this before but i'm like we're buying water that's bottled. <laughs> like, really think about that. <laughs> like, re really think about that. We're buying water that somebody went and took out of our springs for free, and they put it in a bottle, that, and they're selling it to us. You know, that's the crazy thing. So you have, and, I, and I, again, someone can correct me if I'm wrong on my facts. I know that this happens, but I believe the, the company is Coca-Cola, and, and they own Aquafina, and they've been given rights to go and take water out of our springs for free for f like who gets that kind of deal who who you know, i just go how did the, how, like who's the brilliant politician goes hey i'll tell you what you can take not only can you take water out of our springs but you can do it for free how's that sound for a deal you know it's like why would you do that <laughs> Why? And our springs are already, you know, hurting just like the rest right. of our waterways. So it, it is, it's insane what they allow. I mean, I always say permits, like, because they permit them to go do that, you know, they permit these companies to dump their waste. I always look at permits as permission to pollute, basically. I mean, they're contributing to our issues with the springs by taking the water out of our springs and depleting the water. We already have a water consumption issue where, you know, the springs are starting to dry up. And you're right. I don't know why, who in the world thought, I mean, that's a good question. Who thought that that was okay? <laughs> where, and, and the thing is, is where's the media? I want, somebody, I want somebody from the media to go to the politicians allowed this and go, why did you ever agree to this deal? What, you know, what, did they promise you, what, a couple jobs, you know, that, you know, oh, well, it's going to bring, it's going to bring jobs to the community. And even if that were true, at what, again, at, to what expense? Like you said, our springs are already drying up, and, and you're going to allow them to continue to pump millions of gallons out of these springs <laughs> for profit, which we get none of. It's not even like Coca-Cola sat there and said, hey, look, for all the profit we make, we'll give you 20% of the profit. No, we don't get anything. No. And I go, you're the worst businessman in the <laughs> world. Seriously. Like, I, I, I can't even, I can't fathom how in the world you get that kind of deal without them lining your pockets they're they're lining their pockets all right i mean think about every hurricane season and how much i mean we clear the shelves if you go into a grocery oh, store yeah. they're cleared of wa bottled water i'm like huh i'm so glad i don't have I to know. deal with that <laughs> you know because i just fill up my water and i'm good i have an on the counter and under the sink and my on the counter i could put river water in it and it should be fine just filtering that through yep. and I'm like, you There's know. There's a peace of mind that comes with <laughs> yes. that, the, that I never, because here's the other thing too, and correct me if I'm wrong. The, um, the municipality has up to 48 hours before they have to warn you. So something could happen to your water 
and they're not legally bound to say they, – they have 48 hours before they have to tell you, hey, you need to boil your water, when in fact – you should have been boiling your, boiling your water two days or what you know whatever uh, the, the time was, but they have up, up to two days to, before they tell you to boil your water. So you could have been drinking contaminated water for two days before you even know it was contaminated. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. I mean, typically when they put out a boil notice, it's you've already been drinking the contaminated water. Right. So, and, and I cannot tell you the peace of mind of having the filtration system I have knowing going, I'm good. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and, and I stress to people. And, you know, look, and like you said, it's not about any particular filtration system. Just make sure it's NSF certified and make sure that you're covered because you're not just talking about yourself. You're talking about your loved ones. You're talking about your children. You're talking about your pets, you know, and your your spouses and, and everyone else around you. And it's like, why would you not take that precaution for, for a less than it would cost to go out to dinner at a decent restaurant you know yep. one time yep it's it's exactly right i mean it is a peace of mind for me too i love the fact like when i have my neighbors like oh you know did you taste it they'll do chlorine burnouts i don't know if you've ever heard that where they clean out the system usually once twice a year and that's when you really get the chlorine i mean it's really high in chlorine you can taste the chemicals yeah. and and I don't know when they're doing that because mine's filtered. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> I do remember, though, and I, I always wondered why on particular times you could taste or smell the chlorine worse than other times. And I didn't know that's what that was. Yeah, it's a chlorine burnout. And they um, they ba are basically cleaning out the system is what they're doing. And they, it takes a little while. But they typically put out a notice about it, but people don't see it. And then you'll see a lot of complaints online where people will say, why is my water taste more chlorine than usual or um and typically that's what it is i would go on your city website and see if there's any notice that talks about cleaning out that system to see if they have and and actually they even put a little disclaimer saying if you're in the vulnerable population like you know you're the elderly or you have you know certain underlying conditions you shouldn't drink it they have that in as their disclaimer and you'll see it also on their annual report it's in small writing but that to me speaks, <laughs> yeah, it speaks volumes to me that they have to put that little disclaimer. All right. So what about people who are going to say, okay, you're sitting here worried about chlorine being in your water. And yet, you know, I personally, I have a pool which has chlorine. Of course, I'm not drinking the water, but does it have an effect by being absorbed into the skin? Like, and, and the other thing too is because, and then this is a legitimate question because I noticed people who've been in pools their whole life like swimmers and divers and stuff and 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 some of these people and again i know a lot has to do with genetics um but they live well into their 80s and 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 uh and they seem to be quite healthy up until the day they die um does the chlorine the fact that they're in it they're in a pool with chlorine does that have any effect at all do you think or yeah i mean I, it can because if you there's some people but it just depends because some people have um, psori psoriasis, is that what it's called? The psoriasis, skin yeah. Mm -hmm. And then eczema, so it can flare up certain conditions like that, skin conditions. But as far as, I don't know if there's a dermal um, issue, like the absorption into your skin, if it, it affects you internally. Um, you know, I know that there's been studies on other contaminants, like perfluorinated compounds, when it comes to that, but I'm not too sure about chlorine. I, I think it's more of a skin issue, like dries out your skin, mm -hmm. dries out your hair, things like that, but think about what it's doing inside if it does it to your skin, you know? Right. So you also talked about in, like in, inhaling it, like breathing it in, because when you said when you boil the water, it releases vapor. these chemicals in a vapor, which you can take in, and that happens with Teflon pans. Now, I know there's a company that had Teflon, but they said they didn't have that chemical in it, which, you know, was one of the main selling points for buying their particular brand of, uh, of um cookware cookware mm -hmm. and uh and so i know that's important too because they said what happened was is they did the canary effect where if they had a canary above uh, these pans that were cooking and these vapors were released the canary died and i was like holy crap that's, that's sort of like you know like taking the canary down into the coal mines you know and if, the, if it dies you're in trouble so <laughs> Um, and so that is something that's very real. And, mm -hmm. and so not just um, taking it in through the skin where you said it might just dry up the skin, but inhaling it um, or breathe in, breathing it in because of the vapors 
is a concern as well. Yes. And I mean, even with your shower, you know, make sure you get a shower filter too. Right. And you may notice, especially here in Florida, you may notice your hair is 10 times better once you do that filter. It's not as dried out. <laughs> I mean, I know you don't have any hair, but <laughs> hey, I'm hey, just hey, saying, or your skin, bit, yeah. <laughs> or your skin may seem a lot better. You might have a clearer skin. I'm just saying, try it out. You may notice a big difference. Now, I will say this. Um, I need to, I need, because I had a shower filter and in the move, I don't know what happened to it. So I need to buy another shower filter. And I did notice a difference. I, I will say that the company I did, I use, they had one because they said, you know, that, um, and I didn't, yeah, they they were talking about babies. And I go, yeah, I go, I understand a shower filter for me because I like the water as hot as I can. So I can assure you there's steam. And so all that stuff is in the vapors. But I go, we don't normally give babies baths at that, you know, at that kind of temperature where there's steam mm -hmm. <laughs> and vapors uh, coming up. So, um, but you're saying that, that bathing in it, uh, uh, um, yeah. I mean, there's concern if if your ingestion is obviously a huge concern. But we were talking about vapors, and that's why it made me think of the the showers because you were saying it's really hot, and they can actually volatilize from the heat coming up, and you're breathing it in that way. And I know that there's been a lot of people that have asked me about shower filters, not just for that, but because of their skin issues. They have well, eczema and, you know, and, and a lot of women will come forward and say, well, my hair is so brittle and it's falling off and it's, you know, I'm getting a lot of hair fall out. And then they notice when they get that filter, it makes a tremendous difference and their skin is either clearing up or, you know, their hair seems to be a lot better, it, it just healthier and fuller and... Yeah, I can imagine, like, if we, if, like, especially when you said when they do this chlorine burst, could you imagine if it's, it'd be like bathing in your, in your swimming pool and washing your hair in your swimming pool and you're going to have that chlorine that's going to dry your hair out and dry your skin out. Why would you not think that, you know, if you had that kind of chlorine in your shower, that it would do the same exact thing? Exactly. So exactly. Now, now you made me go. Okay, I got to purchase my filter <laughs> because I've noticed my skin has become more dry. dry. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it, and it and it's like, just like I notice when I get out of pool, it's you know it's always dry, and it's because of the chlorine. And so the first thing I do is I shower, but you know it, I have to go put you know my coconut oil on or whatever yep. I use, and uh, and um, yeah, so I need to get a. A shower filter. I have to make sure I do that today. <laughs> but I think, you know, a lot of people love that little bit of advice, you know, when they when they hear that. And I've heard a lot of people come back to me, I did the shower filter, and oh my gosh, let me tell you what, <laughs> it made a difference. Right. So, and then that's one other way. But, you know, filter obviously is the first thing. I would say, you know, the next thing is make your voice heard. I mean, if you've been affected in any way, um, make your voice heard don't be afraid to write your city council i mean they're there to represent you we the people you know that's who they represent they're not there they're not supposed to be representing the polluters and and these other industries you know but if we don't make our voices heard i've been told before you know at a commissioner meeting they're like well there's only five of you there's only five of you so nobody really cares about this issue and they basically base their decisions off if there's a lot of people that show up Versus, you know, how many other, if there's only five people, well, only five people care. So they kind of dismiss, they can dismiss it that way. Okay, it's so, so there's, there's something to be said about numbers. So, and there's a lot of people who might want to do something and they're too scared to do it on their own or don't know how to do it. And so they just feel helpless and go, yeah, I, I don't know where to even start. And if I make, and what they'll do is they might make one phone call and if they don't get the right answer, they give up. So... Is there is there a group? Is there an organization where people can call, people can contact, people can go on Facebook, people can you know email, whatever? Let's let's just do the simple things. Let's not email. Let's just talk about. Is there a Facebook group where people can get together, or some other sort of group where they can see that there are other people out there just like them, and and there's comfort in numbers, and and where you know you have support, and that you're not the only one who feels this way. What can pe you know, where yeah. can people go? So I think that's absolutely the first step is getting connected. And so um, I'm actually a registered 501c3. And my organization is called Fight for Zero. 
And that, that name actually came up because I was at a council meeting and I brought up that we found PFBA in the actual drinking water during one of our tests. And the city manager at the time said, um, well, it's, it's, you know, at the safety limit. And I said, it should be zero. There should be no safety limit for these extremely dangerous bioaccumulative chemicals. And so we all thought, fight for zero. We need to fight for zero chemicals. We need to fight for zero pollution. I like that. And so that's where the name came from. And so we do. We do have communities on Facebook. We have Fight for Zero Central Florida, Fight for Zero Bavard, which is one of the most active Facebook groups. And then we also have a blog, a website. Um, we have Twitter, Instagram. We're pretty much everywhere. And so you can get connected with us on any of those platforms. And I think that is definitely the first step. If you're worried about your water, water quality, um, you know, environmental health, if you feel like your illness may have been uh, contributed by something environmental, we have a crowdsourcing um, form that we have on it. We call it community reporting. And you can go on our website and you can actually submit your illness information, your disease information, and you and and what we do is eventually we'll map it. We don't do close-up maps of, like, you know, people's homes or anything. But it helps us get a visual, and it helps us take it to Tallahassee and Washington, D.C. Because one of the things that I've always embraced, and I think that I did differently than most grassroots groups, because we're still a grassroots group. But what we did differently is we embraced the data and the science that goes with this so that we had evidence and that they couldn't dismiss us. When we would go up to those podiums, it's very difficult for them to argue science, right? So we started doing our own independent testing on water. We started gathering our own data and we started presenting that data and saying, you know, here's our, our test. The test showed that these chemicals are in here. It forced their hand to have to test themselves and find the chemicals too. And I think that's what really, really set us apart is because we embraced that aspect of everything. So definitely get connected with us. Because there's so much information. There, the community is amazing. It's not just cancer survivors and patients, but it's everybody in the community asking questions about filters. Um, you know, if there's a water problem, where do they usually go to? They go to our group and they say, there's a funny smell in our water today. And so we usually try to carry, you know, drinking water tests. And we'll try to go down there and just do a simple test for them to see what's in it. And we usually suggest, you know, obviously filter your water. But Yep, that's, that's a place to go to, to get connected and to begin your journey and learning more. We try to push education out. We try not to be, get, you know, political because we really feel like this isn't a red or blue issue. For us, this is a human issue, right? This is um, a health issue. This is water quality issue, and we try to stay focused on that. But we do educate on who's voting for what. We educate on who's making decisions and um, we even try to draft up letters to make it easier for people. You know, we'll say, here's a template. All you have to do is copy it, make it your own, and send it off. So we, we do a lot of different things to try to combat the water quality issues here in Florida. You said something um, earlier about Erin Brockovich. Have you worked with her? Has she been part of uh, a help with your movement, or have you thought about reaching out to her? Or? Yes, actually, we did. We um, had her come in 2018, September. We hosted a meeting with her on the east coast of Florida. She came to do a tour of all of Florida because our waterways were just so, I mean, they were in national news. We were having a lot of issues. We still are. And so we were able to host a meeting with her, and it was about a five-hour meeting. She's amazing. Um, her Does she team, look like Julia Roberts? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny because she gets up there on the stage, and that's the first thing she's like, I'm not Julia Roberts, but <laughs> I'm not what you guys think. This. I mean, she's amazing. I mean, you can tell she's really for the people. She really, really cares. And she's been doing this so long, for decades, you know. And one of her goals is that she really wants to build up communities to take on the fight. I mean, she's one person. And to me, she's a superhero. But she says we need to be our own superheroes in our communities. And that's kind of what she does. She'll come to the community, and she really motivates. She tells her story. I mean... You know, when she came, she brought up some, there were a few things that stuck out to me, but it really motivated me and made me feel like, thank you, God, that there's somebody else that gets what I've been through as an activist, right? People call me an activist because, you know, doing this work also comes with criticism and oh, yeah. things like that. And she said, 
I was collecting these frogs. I'm, if you guys haven't seen her movie, Aaron Brockovich, you got to watch it. But she was collecting frogs. Like, a lot of that movie is true in, in what she's done. And she, she said, these frogs had, like, three legs, right? And they tried to tell me that shit was normal. <laughs> that these frogs having three legs was normal and three eyes. And and she's like, I just knew it wasn't normal. And I took it down to a lab. And, and so, you know, some of the stories she said, I'm like, oh, my God, it's so true. They try to normalize this crap. Like, they try to normalize whole entire streets getting cancer, they try to normalize that. That's not normal. It's not normal to have your neighbors and then your neighbors on the other side, your neighbors across from you, all getting cancer within the five-year range all around the same time. That is not normal. We need to stop normalizing things and start looking at it, you know, how the way it is. Like, that's not normal. If you visit anywhere else in the United States and you see people with cancer all across the streets, it's not normal. If you visit somewhere else and you ask, has anybody had cancer on the street? And they're like, well, what are you talking about? You talk to anybody out of state, they'll tell you it's not normal. Right. <laughs> you know? I, <laughs> it's just crazy. Yes, yeah, she, she did. She came in and she does. She'll post stuff every once in a while. If you follow her page on, on Facebook, you'll see her post a few things on Florida. And she tries to help really bring awareness. And, you know, and her team is there. Like, if we reach out to them and... We have a question, like, do you, you know, what do you think about this? And, you know, they'll get back to us, and they do help. So, all right, so you have the Fight Z- fight for Zero mm-hmm. uh, Facebook group? Mm-hmm. Okay. So what else can they do? Where else can they go to, to become part of a group? What I mean, it, can people donate, too? Because I know there are people out there who, who want to help um, but may not be able to physically do something is there somewhere they can donate is there something they can do um man phones or something of that nature to to make people aware yeah i mean they can certainly donate on our website which is fight and then the number four and then spelled out zero dot org um and then they could we also have different teams so we have our regional directors which are people that have been with us for a while you have to be with our organization for at least six months to become a regional director and they Um, represent our region, whether it's the west coast of Florida, southwest, northwest, and then we have our county directors. And the the county directors, we are constantly looking for, you know, you can represent a county, and your job is to basically keep an eye on everything that's going on with your commissioners and your cities with their agendas to see if there's anything with environment or water quality um, and to keep, you know, and and to keep contact with with certain individuals and also county leaders, take care of the grassroots team that's underneath them. So that's the next team that we have. And that's the one that most people are on is the grassroots team. And the grassroots team does things like science, citizen science. So people really love that hands-on thing. So sometimes we'll go out and do trash pickups and try to contribute um, in the best way that we can. And we also do citizen science where they'll go out and they'll take samples for us when we need it out in the waterways. And then we send it off for them. Right now we have a three-year study with the University of Florida Um, We're doing the community outreach aspect of that on the East Coast. It's in Bavar County. And so we really, really need citizen scientists for that particular project. And we do have projects like that where we need people on the project. And it doesn't take time at all. You know, as I know, people are limited on time, and I respect that. Um, All they had to do is, like, a virtual training so they know how to properly get the samples and, like, what they should wear and, like, little things like that. And then we would just call them, you know, and say, hey, can you get a sample for us on this day? And they'd get the sample, and I would come and pick it up. So there's there's different areas that they can contribute in if they really want to get involved. I just had a brilliant idea. I get these often. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Anybody that knows me knows that's a... <laughs> um, have you reached out to, like, the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America? No. I would definitely do that because they're always looking for things like that to to be part of the community and to help part of the community. Like they'll do, you know, they'll actually go clean up trash and stuff like that. But they would love, like I know I used to be a Boy Scout. And when we had stuff like that where we could do, where we could go test water or whatever, that would be right up their, right up their alley. And you would have volunteers out the wazoo across the state, you know, if you were to reach out to the different Boy Scouts uh, and Girl Scout 
organizations. I'll definitely have to do that because I love getting our youth involved. Yeah, and I was going to say, and they're the ones who really need to pick this up and run with it because they're, you know, again, old farts like me, they're just going to sit their butts <laughs> and they're not going to do anything because they, they don't care. But the younger generation, they un they understand the importance of this. And I think they would, I truly think getting them involved with it would definitely be a plus for you. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, and we try to do, we'll do hikes and stuff with the younger kids, you know, uh, and they love the hikes where we'll just go on a, a small hike and try to get them to really connect with nature and appreciate nature because they are our future generation. We always say, you know, what kind of world are we leaving for our kids? But it's more like what kids are we leaving for our world? Right. So. Unfortunately, the ones that we <laughs> <laughs> that's another topic for another day. Um, you you had mentioned you know that with being an activist, you know, you it's not all like where everybody's like, oh, that's a great job. You have people who are sitting there, you know, fighting against you and trying to discredit you, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you get some crazies out there that. You know, I mean, you're a good looking woman, obviously. And so I'm sure that you even get cr those type of crazies, too. Yeah. Um, you know, when I got into this work, I wish somebody would have warned me or given me some kind of heads up. I would. It, it's something that you just don't know until it happens. Um, you know, I was just trying to use my voice and trying to make a change. And I was so hyper focused on that. And eventually it turned into, you know, our leaders trying to discredit me. You know, the first thing they try to do is background checks on you. And thank, oh, yeah. thank goodness I don't have a background because that's the first thing they try to use against you. And so they couldn't find the background. So what did they start doing? They started looking up all the people that were with me's background. And then they would nitpick little things out of their background. Like, well, that person is, you know, they got a DUI or that person, um, you know, was arrested for disorderly contact and that's the type of people she's surrounding herself with and <laughs> you know like judging my character off of the people that wanted to volunteer and help which was just so crazy because they were just trying to help you know and and she they started pulling all their records and I mean there's just so much more that's occurred like like you said I'm I've dealt with the stalking I've dealt with I've actually had to send cease and desists <laughs> to um just like to a community member that got obsessive and you know would just randomly show up and um started <laughs> doing just crazy stuff like <laughs> wow and so we had to do that we had to send no contact orders there's been injunctions where we've had to go to court and um the one injunction did get it got approved and the other one we ended up with a deal just saying leave us the hell alone you know like right. please just leave us alone that's really what it comes down to i'm always like listen if you don't you know, care about our cause or anything, you don't have to come after me. You know what I mean? Like, you could just leave me alone. It's really that simple. Or if you're obsessed with us to the point that you're stalking, um, you know, leave us alone too. <laughs> right. <laughs> it, well, it's, you know, and it's unfortunate because, you know, no matter what cause you're behind or, or what you're doing, there's always going to be crazies out there who go uh, a, over way overboard. And, um, and it's unfortunate because those are, you know, it's those people that always seem to, that people will pick out to represent what you're doing and go, see, these people are crazy. That's it's exactly like, what yeah, they do. Yeah. And it's like, no, they don't represent us. <laughs> and we don't, you know, and, and it's, it's disingenuous at, at the very least when they do that kind of nonsense. That's what they do. Repeatedly, they would do that. They would say, you know, if there was even one person that would show up to city council that got kicked out. They'd say, they're a part of their group. And we're like, what? No, they're just a part of the community. Like, <laughs> exactly. you know, they're not a part of our group. But I never said a word. I always stayed quiet. Um, I always hold professionalism to a high standard. You know, when I go to meetings, you know, I don't go there with the intention to try to get kicked out or create a scene. And there's some people that are just like that. They, right. they like the attention. It gives them that high. They go in. They want to create a, a scene. They want to yell. They want they want the police to come over and kick them out because then they have an awesome story. They want to get it on camera. On camera and that's just not who I am but I'm like if that's the community and that's what they want to do I'm not going to sit there and, and dictate what they want to do you know what I mean that's right. not my job I'm not their mom you know <laughs> so right. like don't expect me to tell them to sit down and shut up you know you have police officers there for a reason to escort them out and make it a professional setting that's your job well so. I, I think the way you do it is the best way to do it because I you know I I tell people look when you're when you're discussing something with with people 
you know, you want to use reason, but no one's going to listen to reason if you're being unreasonable. And I know this because I've been unreasonable many times. <laughs> I was like, you don't understand. You know, it's like, and you're, you're just not going to get your message across doing that. So be reasonable when you're when you're using reason that's when people will listen to you and so i think that your approach is absolutely correct no one no one wants you know the rest of it is just a, an act you know it's like you're putting on a, a performance for people when you start acting foolish mm -hmm. and uh and you're not accomplishing anything other than having the attention put on you which is if that's what your what your goal is and you know yeah i guess that's uh, you met your goal right yeah, exactly <laughs> you get five <laughs> minutes of attention but it doesn't really change the future and so and, you know, we did, you know, there was also really crazy. This is the most craziest thing, I think. Well, maybe, I don't know. There's been a lot of stuff that's happened. But um, there was an 11-page uh, threat packet sent in the actual United States postal mail uh, to my VP, to his house. And, and so he gets it, and it has all these, like, lunatic rantings about us. Um, you know, just people that we worked with, myself. And it was crazy. Like, it. It, th it was basically like, we're not going to ever leave you alone um, until you hand over all your data. They want our data. They're after our um, crowdsourced cancer data. And we were like, this is so weird. Why are they after all of our data? Like, and then we later found out, so we did public record requests. And we found out that the city printed the packet what? for the individual that sent it mm -hmm, through public records. Did you did you take like were was what kind of threats were in it? I guess it was just basically like you know the threats were like um, we'll never leave you alone. So there it was wasn't some, a death there were threat. Bloody, there were bloody hands in there. Like they put pictures in there with bloody hands. That's like it. Yeah. It, so it, it's so it's it's not saying we're going to kill you, but it's it's insinuating. insinuating. Mm -hmm. Did you turn that over to the FBI? Um, we tried to turn it into uh, the state. We tried to make a complaint because we found out the city was involved in it and they wouldn't accept it. See, this is how this is. I wish people would understand the level of corruption and how high it goes. I, I would I would say you would almost have to take it to the FBI because the states, I mean, especially with. Again, I'm not going to get political, <laughs> but our state's been corrupt for for decades and. Anyway, and the people that run it are just as you know, just as corrupt as any other state that's out there, and uh, and it really isn't about red or blue. It really isn't. It seems like almost all of them are corrupt. It does, seem regardless like that. of what side they're on, and and it's funny because I I keep making this you know point to people. It's like the people on the red side keep pointing out all the flaws on on the people on the blue side and the people on the blue side keep pointing out all the flaws on the people on the red side but they don't see the flaws of their own side they refuse to admit to them they refuse to acknowledge them and they know there are flaws there they can't be that oblivious i know that they know the flaws are there but they'll deny them and then this side will sit there and go oh those people are such in such denial <laughs> it's like yes yeah, and so are you you know <laughs> and so it's because of this this game that they play that when there's issues like this that are of paramount importance nothing gets done about it because because of this game playing and like you said earlier this is a nonpartisan yep. issue this is something everybody should get on a on board with because it affects everybody and yes i know that the, the you know people who are wealthy tend to be able to afford filtration systems for their whole house and stuff and so maybe it doesn't affect them the way it affects those in, in lower income neighborhoods but you know if we have any humanity in us uh, at all we should care about each other and not just ourselves yes exactly that's that's where i'm at in life i you know i've taken on these communities and i've really grown to love a lot of families and consider them my own now because of how much we've built a relationship with a lot of the people within these communities. And it's just so important to me to make that difference and to help them in any way that I can. Well, I think what you're doing is honorable, it's admirable, and I think that it's, uh, it's, it's of the utmost importance. And I'm glad that there's someone like you out there. And I know there are others like you out there that are that are working diligently to to make sure that you know that the communities are aware of what's going on and to help change the laws so that these things you know so that these things don't continue um, affecting us and and I 
and any support that people can give you, I'm all about it. And um, and I want to have you on here. When you tell me what you need, and you're welcome back anytime. I'll be happy to have as many shows as it takes to to get your message out there because I think it's that important. Thank you for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's, it's been so great. Uh, thank you for coming. I mean, it, it's been a pleasure. And this, you know, when I heard your story, I was like, you know, I had a woman on here um, at the beginning when I first started my podcast. Her name is Joanne. Great woman. This woman's in her 70s, and she ru- she will run circles around us. She has so much energy, <laughs> and and she spoke about it. And while she had she had um, an issue with poisoning herself, it was from chemicals when she was working in a um, and uh, dry cleaners, and so and she was seeing these chemicals get dumped into our water system, which people don't realize. You know these pharmacogens when people when people take their pills or old pills and dump them down the toilet those they all go into our water system and these are not getting cleaned out from our water system um so when you were saying on top of it that they want to add lithium i'm uh-huh. just going what it's the crazy. it's crazy so you know um so when i heard your story i was like it's so important that people know that this is happening to real people and it's it this isn't just a one-time Aaron Brockovich thing this is the reason Aaron Brockovich has been doing this for decades is because it continues to happen throughout this country and uh and we need to start doing something about it because if we don't it's going to continue to affect us and our younger generations and our children and people need to go I, I don't know what you know it's like if you love your children as much as you say then this is a this isn't I hate this phrase but it's a no brainer mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it really is so thank you for thank you for taking your time and uh, and thank you for all your hard work and um, anything else is like any any other sites anything that the people can go to to help out in any way uh, I'll make sure to to provide all the links um, so that people who are interested can come into your website and um, yeah I mean our website. You know, you can go there if you want to help in any way and fill out. There's forms on there. And then we also have a load of resources. So if you feel like you want to do some research, we've tried to put it all out there with links and everything. So we have our blog that talks about, you know, um, drinking water specifically. It talks about filters. It talks about solutions. And so if you need reading material, too, and you want to be able to share it with family and friends, you can do that. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, Estelle. Yeah, it, it was a pleasure. Well, folks, thank you, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, as always, until next time, stay safe, take care, and wear your mask. <laughs>